Hello everyone. So this is the makeup Zoom meeting for September 14th. And we're going to talk about um, seeds, seed anatomy, the purpose of seeds. We're going to talk a little bit about berries versus um, other kinds of fruit. Um, please feel free to pause, fast forward, get to whatever point you need to in the Zoom recording. Um, if you have any questions, you know how to email me and please um, feel free to reach out. Um, if you did watch this video as a way to make up for your Zoom meeting, if you did not attend the other one, please go ahead and send me an email so I can make sure to count you for attendance. Um, so today we're going to talk here about seeds and their purpose. So the cool thing about a seed is that it has all of the genetic material and DNA necessary to be able to start a new plant. It's just like an embryo, whether you have a human embryo, um, a dog embryo, a cat embryo, it's going to have all of the necessary materials to start a new whatever that is. And so in this case, we're talking about seeds. And the really cool thing is seeds, it's kind of like um, an all-in-one package where it has all the materials needed. It just needs to get activated via moisture. Um, because most of the time, seeds are in the stage of dormancy. And this is when they're kind of in a bunker mode. Um, they are protected, they are not growing, um, they are not progressing into different stages. Um, the nice thing is about seeds is that they're easy to transport and to move. Um, seeds are transported a lot of times by the wind, even by water. Um, when animals eat seeds and then sometimes they poop them out, and it actually gives the seeds fertilizer and moisture to be able to start a new plant. Um, humans, we also have adapted to be able to use seeds um, where we can store them for years even to be able to continue on certain um, species and varieties of things. Um, we can share seeds with our neighbors or even countries sharing seeds. Um, the most important thing is when you're storing seeds is you really wanna make sure that they are staying in a really dry and cool environment. Heat can kill seeds 100%. So you wanna make sure they're not in full sun um, because it can cook the seed. Um, and you also wanna make sure that it's not exposed to any moisture before you're ready because that can also um, damage a seed by activating it, but not getting it the materials that it needs um, to be able to actually continue the activation. The activation can be started, let's say if you accidentally soak um, a seed packet and you're like, oh shoot, you're gonna wanna make sure to completely dry it off and even then it still may not live. So you wanna make sure it's coming in a completely dry and cool environment. Um, you might want to take some notes during this time. Um, this will help you on your quiz later, but please don't feel, don't feel like you have to write everything down. So here's an example of a dicot and a monocot. We're going to see these later. This will also help you with your seed dissection lab. Um, if you have any questions about that, you know how to email me. So the outside of the seed is called the seed coat, and that's a protective area um, that prevents it from moisture before it's ready. So it takes a little bit of time for moisture to get through that seed barrier and it also acts as a heat protectant. Um, just protecting that embryo, protecting all that DNA, because it takes a lot of energy for plants to be able to produce seeds, and they really wanna make sure that they have the best opportunity possible to pass on their DNA to a new plant. Just like um, people are very protective um, if they are choosing to have a child, they wanna be really protective of that because it's a lot of energy to go into that. Same thing if you've ever seen um, a dog who's given birth to puppies. She can be really protective over that because she wants to ensure that they're safe. Um, so the seed coat ensures that that seed is going to be protected and safe. Now the endosperm, the endosperm and cotyledon um, both act as nutrients for that seed. Um, so when we're here, let's see, we have a seed, here's the surface, and the seed is planted below the surface. It's going to take a lot of energy for that seed to activate create those first few little seedlings, and then go all the way to above the surface. But it needs to have enough energy to be able to make that journey, activating, creating root systems, creating shoot systems, to be able to get to the top. And so it's kind of like if you were gonna go on a really long road trip to see a friend. Let's say it's gonna take you six hours. Now you know when you get to your friend's house, you're gonna be able to eat dinner, but you have to have some sort of energy to be able to make that road trip to when you can do dinner, have dinner at your friend's house. It's same thing like a seed. It's gonna take a lot of energy to be able to make it to the surface, but once you're at your surface, you can do photosynthesis. They can absorb, um, the seed leaf can absorb the sunlight um, and it can start relying on photosynthesis. But however, it needs to kind of pack a lunch to be able to make it to the surface. So that's what the endosperm does, is it acts as that nutrients, 
um, to be able to give um, that embryo the best chance possible and all that energy to be able to get to the surface. Now the cotyledons, that's what gives the plant energy once it's above the surface. So the seedling, it finally gets here to the surface and all of that endosperm is gone. It's really used up its sources. Um, so the cotyledon, if you looked at a bean plant, um, it kind of acts as like a little jet pack. And as soon as it gets above the surface, it's gonna unfurl and it's gonna act as these two tiny little leaves. And that's what they're actually, they can do photosynthesis, otherwise they're called photosynthetic. So they do photosynthesis and they're able to get that seedling energy right away because it's gonna take a little bit of time for that seedling to actually grow leaves, to really develop that shoot system and get taller and broader. It needs nutrients right away. And the cotyledon act as those first leaves and they start doing photosynthesis so that plant can be on the right track. Now, when we look here, um, like I said, the embryo, it actually has everything needed to be able to start a baby plant. So we have here at the bottom, and it's kind of hard to see on the corn seeds when we do our dissection. So the bean's the easiest way to see it. Um, however, the corn and monocots, they have all of it. It's just really easy to see on a big bean seed. So at here at the bottom, that's gonna act as um, the root system, the radical. And so that's the genetic, um, that's the kind of starter pack that'll turn into the root. You have the hypocotyl, which is this middle section here that turns into the stem. And then you have the epicotyl that act, turns into the young leaf. These are called angiosperms, A-N-G-I-O-S-P-E-R-M. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't spelled it out loud in a while. Um, they're all called monocots or dicots. And mono means one, di means two. And then cotyledon refers to um, the cotyledon, or cot refers to cotyledons inside a plant. Let's go back here. So dicots, when you do your bean dissection, after you've soaked your bean in water, you're gonna notice it's really easy to wiggle apart. And that's gonna split easily into the two cotyledons. The corn, however, is a lot harder. You actually have to cut it in half because there's no cotyledons to easily split apart. There's only one cotyledon. Um, so monocots, some examples of those are things like um, zucchini, um, Let's see here, pumpkins, um, beans, peas, all those sorts of things are gonna have two cotyledons. Um, examples, sorry, that was of dicots. Monocot examples are things like corn or grass or orchids, and they all have specific attributes to them based off of the seed. And so I am gonna link here another YouTube video. I watch this every year here with my students and it gives a lot of really good information um, and a lot, they have a lot of resources where they can show you different plants and the different characteristics. So after you watch this video, I'd love for you to click on this. I'll put it in um, the description below. And I'd like you to watch that. I think it's about three to four minutes and just take some notes on the differences between monocots and dicots. That will help you here in your, um, in your next quiz here. Sorry, I got my oven going off. I'll be right back. And we're back. I'm cooking some pumpkin for my chickens. All right, so this last year part, oh, see, so yeah, we talked here a little bit about monocot attributes. This is what we did in class. So we have things like grass, orchids, um, and you can look here. So we have flowers in multiples of three or six. Um, the veins, when you look at a vein, it's actually going to be parallel. You have an example here. It might be a little hard to see, but these grasses here, they have veins that go up and down. And then the roots, if you've ever had to dig up grass before, you can definitely attest to this. They have lots of fibrous roots that really grab on and they're called very advantageous because they really grip onto the soil um, and they make it very difficult to pull up. So dicot attributes, um, they have two cotyledons. So you have examples of pansies, zucchini, beans, um, a lot of different kinds of trees, carrots. Um, and their flowers are mul multiples of three or four or five. Their veins, um, you can actually, if you're able to see the veins in your wrist, you'll see just like us, net veined, 
Um, or if you've ever looked like at a maple leaf or something like that, you'll see that the veins are um, branched out. And then they also have tap roots. Now that doesn't mean the roots don't stretch out. They just go a little bit deeper and they're not as um, surface level and spread. Now this last part here, you don't need to write anything down. This is just some information um, that I thought was interesting. It got me thinking about berries and fruits and seeds. And so we talk about berries versus fruits that are other types. Um, berries have to have to be considered a botany berry. Um, you have to have more than one seed and you have to has to only come from one ovary. So we look here in the flower and I'm going to look at the female section of the flower that we'll talk about later in class, the pistil, and inside here is the ovary. Now if you ever cut an apple in half you can actually kind of see what the ovary looks like and inside the ovary are the seeds. And after the seeds have been fertilized, so um, pollen lands here on the stigma, it goes down here through the style into the ovary, and those seeds get fertilized, just like a chicken's eggs would get fertilized if there was a rooster around. Um, now, a berry, like I said, has to have more than one seed and must come from one ovary. Um, so from examples here, um, like a blueberry. A blueberry is considered a botanal berry because it contains more than one seed and it came from a flower with only one ovary. But a raspberry actually technically isn't a botany berry. It's called a common berry because we refer to it as a berry. Um, but that flower that the raspberry come from had multiple ovaries. So each one of those little pockets in a raspberry comes from a single ovary or a subunit ovary called a droop. Um, same thing here with blackberries or huckleberries. Each one of those little bumps inside of it come from a single ovary. However, things that you wouldn't consider a common berry, things like bananas, grapes, eggplants, oranges, lemons, um, watermelon, cucumber, cranberries, those all have more than one seed and they came from a single ovary. So considered berries. So like I said, that berry information, just something kind of interesting. Um, our assignments for the week if you're in horticulture is that monocot versus dicot quiz, the seed discussion, and the seed dissection. If you have any questions about that, let me know. If you are in roots, this is going to be for the monocot versus dicot quiz, the seed dissection, and then also the workplace teamwork dissection or discussion. Well, if you have any questions, let me know, um, and you can always email me.